questions arrayed across the, the for, for each one of the groups of candidates. Hopefully we'll get to all of them. If we do, we certainly want to allow time for some questions from the audience. But uh, So the first question will be, and, and I'm uh, assisted here this evening by uh, Julia Harrington, who is a student at Hampton. And uh, do you want to come up and ask the first question, uh, Julia? And the first question is, the first question is going to go to um, Councilman Stokes, um, candidate Young, Pugh, and Walsh. Oh, and I'm sorry. Yes, that's very important. I have to take my, my cell phone out. The time limit is 90 seconds for a response, and we'll, we'll, we'll wave our hand to let you know. We believe that free and plentiful access to recreation, recreation centers will lower our crime rate for teens in the city. Where would you build such a center for our community? Why and how long would it take? <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Cindy Walsh, the mayor of Baltimore. My whole campaign platform is about removing Baltimore Development Corporation and all of the global corporations in every agency in Baltimore City Hall and rebuilding them out into every community. So each community will have a municipal building. It will have a public school. It will have public health clinics, mental health clinics, and it will have a public recreation center. Uh, that is the key to having citizen voice. It's the key to collecting the data that we need in every agency so that we know that it's accurate. They're, they're, that's where you're going to see transparency. And you're also going to get, um, you're going to address the issues of fraud and corruption that are now tied to all of the agencies because of that partnership where nobody has any access. It's all proprietary. So your answer is, Every community will have a public recreational center as part of my building out Baltimore City agencies to every community. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, respondent is uh, Mr. Young. And, and if you need us to repeat the question, please. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you guys. Right here in Hamilton, which is my neighborhood, I've been living here, me and my family, since 1997, I went to Hamilton Elementary Middle uh, for middle school. So it's good to see you guys, so many neighbors and people running for office here. Um, happy to be here. Uh, specific to your question with regards to you know, where we build rec centers, absolutely rec centers reduce crime because it helps to take students off the street, away from bad elements. And the reality is we put them exactly where the students are. We put them in our neighborhoods and we put them where our schools are. We have to make sure that rec centers have, you know, a, a lot of different things. And these folks have heard me over the campaign trail talk about the types of rec centers and what they look like in the future, not just being basketball courts and swimming pools, but also having 3D printers and coding classes and these types of, you know, additive, additive manufacturing technologies that are really going to prepare our kids for the 21st century. And for kids, they're actually, you know, a lot of fun. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of great things that, that our students can do if we're making those types of investments, specific to how long it's going to take. It doesn't take that much and it doesn't take uh, that long to do. Honestly, I think that we can, we can do it in the first term of myself, if I'm the elected the next mayor, or whoever's elected mayor. Uh, we can make sure that we have these types of investments and that it can be done at very low cost. And it's not just building facilities, but it's building resources and people who can give these types of trainings and, and, and activities to our kids. Because we already have the infrastructure. Right now, all we need is the, the, those resources and the right, the right type of leader in charge to make those types of decisions. That's why I'm running for mayor. Again, my name is Calvin Young. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm glad to be here. Even though I had to leave early, but let me just say that we are bringing back 290 million dollars for community planning and which will go into building what I call community schools. We also have a billion dollars coming back. So I think what we really need to do is sit down with the community groups and organizations and say where exactly should we be putting those. The schools are on a plan to, to put schools, community schools in every part of the city. As you well know, there are similar type schools, the Baltimore Design School, where we not only have recreation, but we also have clinics, health clinics inside the school. 
Everybody understands that crime can be reduced as long as we're getting our young people involved in positive activities, whether it is in a recreation center or a training center. And now with the monies that we're bringing back this year, we'll be opening our libraries up from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. as well. Thank you. I was remiss in not saying earlier that uh, Senator Pugh did tell us at the beginning that she has to leave for Annapolis for a voting session this evening. So, um, next, uh, next question. This is for uh, Dixon, Gutierrez, and Logan. That was only three. Yeah. Oh, How will you grow student leadership and engagement so our voices can be heard? Thank you, and this is a great question and a great opportunity. The way that we grow your ability to be heard is by involving you in city government. And the way that we involve you in city government is by extending and expanding our youth commission. As city council president, I created the legislation, a youth commission, a young person from each district. But what has happened is that we need to expand it even more and select young people from different schools as well as the community to be engaged and involved. And what I did and what I want to do even more is I want you to be a part of looking at our budget, looking at our agencies, and assessing our agencies to determine how and what needs to happen for our young people. So through our youth commission, through our PAGE program, through the mayor's internship program that now has been in default, also through our ambassador program. So there are many entities that I have created over the years by working with young people, and that is another way in enhancing and increasing your voice in the school, by either selecting um, in your governmental um, affairs class uh, a representative or young people coming together and making choices of who you want to have part of. But the Youth Commission is a really great first start, as well as our ambassadors program, and our um, internship program. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm also a fellow Northeast resident, so I'm proud to be representing this district in the mayoral's race along with uh, Calvin. This election is really about one thing, results. Because we've heard so many failed promises over the years and all these great plans and ideas, and we've been hearing more great plans and ideas this election season, but what we haven't seen are results, and that's something that I pledge to give you as your next mayor. And the way I'm gonna do that is by focusing on three things, better day-to-day -day management of our people, our processes, and our money. With regards to the question, we're gonna talk about people. We wanna make sure that our students are engaged in the process. We have one of the lowest voter turnouts in the country, only 20% of the people eligible to vote get out and vote. That starts, that seed needs to be planted much earlier. So we need to do more civics education and start it earlier in classrooms so that our students grow up to be good, solid, productive voting citizens. The second thing we want to do is create or enhance our student liaisons to make sure that we have a direct line of communication between our students and the mayor's office so that we can address issues that are pertinent to them in a timely and efficient manner. And then the third thing I'd like to do is offer up internships for students all throughout the year for our seniors or those interested in pursuing public policy. They can get an idea of how things work in reality so they can match that with what they're learning in the textbooks because as I've learned on the campaign trail, they don't always align. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Logan? No, I don't have to call. I got, you're in the next group. But. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Logan is not here. No. No, Walden is here. All right. Um, so we'll move to the uh, to the next group, which is uh, Mr. Mosby, Mr. Murray, and uh, uh, Mr. Walden. <laughs> Ms. Murray, okay. And again, these questions have been framed by the students from the Hamilton Elementary Middle School. We thought it best to get these questions out early because they may have to go on your homework. How can you influence the health department and school board to provide dungeons that are satisfied and healthy? 
So I remember uh, when I became councilman and I went to visit a principal at a high school in my district and he said, well, you know, let's go to lunch. I said, well, let's eat lunch in your cafeteria. And when we went to eat lunch in the cafeteria and looked at the food that they were serving our children, it's no food that we would ever want to eat. I can't even describe to you uh, the type of meat that they put on the plate uh, next to some bread and, and some milk. Uh, we have to do a better job in this city. Unfortunately, uh, for many of our children, the only meals that they get is when they're in school, uh, whether breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And unfortunately, during times of break, like the spring break just now, some of our children did not eat because they were not in school. And we talk about constantly the health disparities in our community, yet we don't necessarily translate that to the food that we provide our children. The city of Baltimore and the school system has to do a much better job of providing healthier meals. Um, while I was on the Education and Youth Committee in the City Council, uh, we've had two hearings where we've brought in the school uh, 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 department to talk about things uh, like the sugary milks that we serve in our schools or like the meat that we have in our schools. And we have to continue to work with the state, continue to work with the city to, in doing so. I think that what we have to do a better job is growing awareness, specifically for our young folks and their parents of the importance of digesting and eating healthier foods. Um, when we look into our communities, we talk about everything from food deserts uh, to the lack of resources and access to quality foods. This is an issue that's not just in our schools, but it's also in our communities. And, and as the next mayor of Baltimore, it's something that I will continue to push. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Murray. Good evening. My name is Laverne Murray. I'm running for mayor as an unaffiliated candidate. Um, my administration would like to implement a task force that we would be able to go in and examine every, at least uh, several schools to examine the food, uh, to find out whether it's nutritional and if it's meeting the standard guidelines. We would implement um, uh, a task force to go forth to examine, to test, to even actually sit down in a lot of schools to find out whether the food is nutritional. Uh, we must keep in mind that uh, the school system provides lunch and breakfast, but it should be nutritional. We cannot compete with the, uh, the, the uh, uh, McDonald's or the fast food restaurants, so we need to make sure that the food that you are expecting to obtain and to get is uh, it's far more nutritional than just a, a fast food style type of food. The other thing is that once we find out the, if the analysis is successful and that I don't believe that every school in Baltimore City is producing horrible food. Uh, uh, come on, let's be real here. Um, but I'm, certainly I know that some schools are not measuring up to the standards so that we have to make sure, and that's going to take testing and that's going to take a, a task force to go in and to see, to find out what those things are. So if and well, if they are like that, then we will strongly advocate to the uh, Department of Health as well as the Board of Education to make the immediate changes necessary to make it edible for our students. Thank you. You have to balance a few things. My name is Alan Walden. I'm a Republican candidate for mayor of Baltimore. You have to balance nutrition on the one hand and taste on the other. The quickest and easiest solution is to make broccoli taste like a Big Mac. <laughs> we can't do that. There's no way to do it. But the simple fact is, food has to taste good in order for the children to not only be filled and fed by it, but to enjoy it as well. Eating should be, to some degree, fun. It was when a lot of us grew up, and it should be for young people now as well. Understand something, and this is important because some people seem to have missed the point. We are a race of omnivores. We are equipped to eat almost anything. We are not herbivores, we do not graze, and we are not pure carnivores who go out after meat all the time. We have to have everything balanced so that the children we feed will not only get the nutrition that's required, but enjoy the experience. It's terrible when children go into schools and look at what's served and say, oh, how can I eat this? Or maybe they don't eat it because it simply isn't appealing enough. 
That's where parents come in, and children too. We need input from the parents and from the children, as well as from the Department of Health and from school officials. Thank you. All right, the, uh, the next question is for candidates Warnock, Cupid, and Craig. <laughs> Do you support placing school police officers in Hamilton, elementary, middle, Bear Heights, RF Lewis, and city neighbors? If not, how will you ensure our school is safe? Is a safe place for learning, and how will you improve our relationship with the police? Well, I don't know if we're omnivores or herbivores, but I do believe that this is the most important election of the generation. I love hearing you speak. Um, <laughs> But our school police officers, I think, play a very productive role. You know, I started Green Street Academy five years ago. It was probably the most important thing that I've done in 10 years. And our school police officer, Officer Davis, is a magnificent individual who is part of the fabric of our school. He not only makes our kids feel safe, he communicates with our kids and makes our kids understand that the people in uniform in our city are doing an incredibly productive job. Now there are people in every profession who do things we don't admire, and they need to be taken out, they need to be punished, and they need to be removed from their jobs. But I have seen school police officers do wonderful things at the school that I started, and I am very supportive of them. Thanks. of safety and education is a really tricky one. And I, my sister is a public school teacher, and I have been since the start of the campaign convening groups of teachers, educators, principals to understand their position and their feelings about a whole host of issues, including school safety. And the overwhelming consensus is that teachers and parents and educators do want a presence of school police, but they want that presence to be one that is a partner, that is a mentor, that is a role model. And so we really have to re-envision the school police model so that it's not, it's not an enforcement perspective, it's a supportive perspective. It's someone who can be a coach and a mentor. Um, down in uh, Digital Harbor, some of the school police run a mentoring program for girls in the school that's incredibly effective. And so we really have to be thinking about it as a resource to support the work of the school. Thank you very much. All right. Uh... <coughs> and again, Students deserve a lot of credit. It's not easy to get them. <laughs> this question will go to uh, Ms. McKesson and Harris. We know that many programs exist to improve the life of our homeless students, families, and neighbors. How will you improve the awareness of these programs? So. I'm sorry. How will you improve the awareness of these programs so more people will benefit? Thank you. That's a, a great question. My name is Joshua Harris, and I believe that the single greatest issue in Baltimore City politics is distribution of capital, and it affects us so many ways. And economic justice isn't always the justice that is the sexy one that gets people wanting to protest and up and pay attention, but it impacts every single one of our lives. And so when it comes to that, we have lots of programs right now in the city that are ineffective in outreach and ineffective in execution. And that means that we are mismanaging funds. And it comes down to systems management, how we choose to hire people who are going to be effective leaders and put systems in place to effectively manage the money that's coming in to these programs, as well as get the word out to the community. Right now we have people who are in city agencies who get paid to do community outreach, 
um, but yet they may not even know who the neighborhood association president is. Uh, and, and that has to change. So we have to make sure that we are putting effective systems in place to manage the money and the capital when it comes to the city's budget uh, so that we can do outreach for these programs. We also know that uh, it's not just about the programs and being reactive to them, but we have to really begin to address the root cause of these issues, which of course is poverty. So how do we begin to address those issues so that we are creating living wage job opportunities for the families that exist here in Baltimore City so that we don't have to worry about children who can't focus in the classroom because they've changed three schools because they've moved three different times in the last four months. We have to make sure that we are working to stabilize our family environment so that our students can be more productive in the classroom. Thank you. My name is Dorea McKesson. I'm excited to be here tonight. And so much of my career has been focused on education. So I was a sixth grade math teacher. I opened up an after school center out of Ashbury on the west side of Baltimore. I managed to, I managed a way to be trained and supported a third of all the new teachers here in Baltimore City. And I was the number two in human capital here in Baltimore City public schools and also in Minneapolis public schools. So I think about these issues often. When I think about homeless students, I'm mindful that in Baltimore, the 35% of the homeless population in the state is here in our city. And when we think about the issue of access, it is a real issue. What's interesting about the school system is that we actually know who the students are. Because we taxi, Baltimore City Public School is actually one of the, the biggest users of taxis in the city. We taxi many of our highly mobile or homeless students and our special ed students, so we know who they are. It's a matter of making sure that we link the resources that are already existing in the city. I'm running for mayor. Part of it is to make sure there's a strategy bringing together all the incredible partners that already exist in the city and making sure that we're maximizing the impact because we, we know who our highly mobile students are. In terms of homelessness, it is about making sure that the homeless population actually has housing that is responsive to their needs. So there's some people who need group homes, there's some people who need institutional settings, and we need to make sure that the housing is actually responsive to the needs of families, and that is the work that hasn't happened yet at scale here in the city. But we know who the students are, we taxi them to school every day, we teach them every day. It's a matter of making sure we concentrate resources, and it's work that I've been devoted to in my career, and the last 18 months has been about telling the truth in public, and that truth is that we can do it, we just haven't had a mayor who understands that we're well enough to do it. Thank you. That's it for all the all the student government. Okay. So now we're going to cycle back through, and, and again, there's a whole series of questions that I have here. They're not my questions. They're questions that came out of the neighborhood associations and from the community association leaders. Um, so bear that in mind. So we're going to cycle back through now. We'll go back up to uh, Young, uh, Pew, and uh, Walsh. Uh, how many people are selling and buying drugs in our city? How much on average are they making and spending? I don't necessarily expect you to know the answers to that. But what jobs can we develop that provide a higher value incentive for people to break that cycle? And what will you do to increase access to treatment options? There's a lot in this question, um, but you know, this reminds me of a conversation I had with some kids in West Baltimore not too, not too long ago. We were hosting a cookout, and they came up to me and said, "We would love to to, to get a job." You know, they're they're participating in illegal activities. I said, "Well, how much would it take for you guys to stop what you're doing to to you know work for a campaign, pass out some literature?" It's ten dollars an hour. This is not a lot of money we're talking about for a lot of these these young people. Uh, and when you look at those who are falling behind the most in our town. We're talking about young African American men between the ages of 14 and 24. These are the college going years. These are, and, and most, most of these, these young men are unemployed mostly because they, they don't have the education to be able to take some of the skilled jobs that, that exist here in our town. You know, for me, I always talk about these, a lot of people say, most of our kids won't be able to go to, go to college. And I, I, I just totally disagree with that. I think our solution has to be long-term. It has to be education-focused. We have to make sure that our students are getting algebra by seventh grade, calculus by 11th grade, starting off with universal pre-kindergarten. And as we're doing that, it, it really puts every child in a place where they can be literally anything they want if they can hit those three pillars. And I think about these young men who, who probably never had calculus, probably don't know what that is, and probably barely got algebra when they were in high school. 
And that literally just sets them up for failure. So when we talk about solutions in our town, that's the number one thing that has to happen. The other thing that I always talk about is, you know, we have to talk, we have to really look at infrastructure projects that can hire people, where we can train kids to, to dig tunnels for a new subway system, things like that. That, that really will be a great solution for our county. Okay. Uh, oh, Cindy Walsh from Mayor of Baltimore. <clears throat> The Baltimore Development Corporation Master Plan is going to continue to install global corporate campuses. We're going to have them all over global corporate factories, and it's going to take more and more of our communities, and it's going to kill our ability to build small business community businesses in our economy, in our communities. My platform is about stopping that. I'm taking the global corporations out of our government. I'm rebuilding all of the agencies back into our community. That includes public health clinics, mental health clinics, including drug rehab. Now when you're building small business economies in every community, you're starting to create a platform for the poorest to have housing security. You're going to build a small fresh food uh, economy that's going to allow uh, food security, and then you're going to have the jobs. We can create 100,000, 200,000 jobs by just creating small business economies in every community. This is going to draw people out of the black market, what I call the drugs and the, uh, the prostitution, the petty theft, and all of this stuff that goes on when you don't have jobs in the community. If you brought, bring them out, have them working in the community, uh, you're going to have people that want to access those drug treatment programs. I have a holistic uh, approach. I am prevention, treatment, and I'm going to have a tracking system set up that we follow these people over the long term to make sure that they get the care that they want, that they have all of the access to the things that they need to be successful and stable, and that's how you, you, you have a success around drug treatment and uh, building healthy communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just say, I want to give some, some data. First of all, there are 77,000 people unemployed in our city. There are 60,000 substance abusers in our city. And today I just met with a group of folks who are working on how to treat people who have substance abuse issues. 10,000 folks come home to our city every year, ex-offenders. 70% of those are substance abusers. Our system tells us that if you are a substance abuser, you cannot even come out of the institution and, and access things like food stamps or public housing because you are a substance abuser. You must pee in the cup and prove that you're not first. I think that is inhumane. So one of the things we're doing is trying to lift that ban on at least allowing people to access food stamps. But we need to do more than that. And we really have to get in front of the problem. Because this is a huge problem. Because we don't have, and I sat down today with a number of other treatment facilities, and what they said is that we are trying to create a seamless approach to substance abuse treatment. And so we have to work on that. The other issue is how do you get jobs to people? And we have jobs growing in Baltimore. And so one of the things, and I think many of you have gotten the literature where I talk about creating a database where we have all of the jobs that are available in the city. 